Hi everyone, and uh, welcome to our things our last keynote of the day. Um, if you're in here, I'm sure you know who our, our next speaker is, that's for sure. He is a legend of gaming journalism. Uh, he is one of the original founders of Electronic Games Magazine, which I think still stands for one of uh, far, far the greatest magazine about video games that just stands to this day. Uh, he is also a great storyteller, if you've ever read his semi-regular columns on digital press or even some of his old Richie Rich comics, uh, then, then you know he's been spinning yarn. And I was uh, really happy to find out that he's coming out with a book uh, called Confessions of a Game Doctor, and it's scheduled to be released this November by Relenta Press. Uh, he's uh, also one of my personal heroes, and he's also a great guy. So if you could please help me welcome Bill Conklin. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I also want to give credit where credit's due. Cap is absolutely the godfather of this book. He's the guy who came up to me and said, you know, I want to take these things and do something with them. And I thought, you know, well, I'm doing something with them. I'm writing them and they're being published. And he said, no, put them in a book. I said, who would be stupid enough to publish a book? Lenny Herman. <laughs> and I, I called Lenny up and he said, yeah, absolutely, I'd love to do it. And the more I get into it, the more I loved it because I, I found that, you know, originally I was all, you know, confessions of the game back and blah, blah, blah. I was gonna, it was going to be all history, you know, it was going to be uh, what it was like in the early days. And I, I began writing that stuff and there was a lot of that stuff. but. It kept bringing up stories. It, it just—it it was like building a house, and you find bones underneath of, of dead bodies, uh, and and that's what I was finding. I kept finding these these hilarious dead bodies, and uh, one of the stories I told a couple of people earlier that you never hear the story, okay? You you never want to hear this story, but back oh god in the 80s, uh, during the days when CES ruled the world. Rodebun paid a premium price to get a location. The location was at the foot of the elevator that took you to the down to the lower level. I mean, the whole ride down the elevator, you were looking straight ahead at that Rodebun booth, and the minute you got off, you were walking right into that Rodebun booth. Now, Datamos, uh, which was operated by a, a fascinating fellow who I've also written about uh, at, at great length, uh, had a relationship with a fellow named Captain Sticky. I don't know if anybody remembers Captain Sticky, but there was a show called Real People on CBS back in the 80s, and the idea was they could find these goofy idiots and they were real people. Okay, and he was a real life crime fighter. He may have looked more like a, uh, a, a dilapidated Knights of Columbus, but he was in fact, he drove around a sticky mobile that fired marshmallows, and, and he always had several uh, females accompanying him. He had a relationship of some sort, God, I don't even want to speculate, with Annie Sprinkle, the famous nude model and photographer. Okay, so he could get any women he wanted in the country. So through this deal, uh, we get the, the data most booth filled with 15 of the most beautiful women you have ever seen in your life. And every guy riding down that elevator rode like this. Okay, at the end of the show, you could have said, what'd you think of the Broderbund booth? There was Broderbund booth? You know, and just, you know, little things like that. These, these little bones kept coming up. And one of the bigger bones that came up that I thought I'd like to read to you is uh, from a chapter called Activision Gets the Fingle, Fickle Finger of Cats. Uh, my partner, Arnie Katz, anybody who knows him, the coolest guy in the world. I mean, Arnie, you, you can't get upset, Arnie upset if you set him on fire, okay? The, the guy is Mr. Cool. But in 1983, he had his freak out. It was early enough that almost everybody has forgotten about it since then. But I'd like to read you, this is an excerpted, uh, excerpted 
uh, from a chapter called, again, Activision Gets the Fickle Finger of Cats, 1983. As I've mentioned elsewhere, even after the original EG was launched, we had a period of several months before the first imitators appeared. Even so, there were so few journalists in those days that everyone was pretty friendly with one another. The guys from video games, joystick, computer gaming world, and some of the other publications were mostly fine folk, and over the years, I worked with quite a few of them. But there was one magazine and its staff with which we were not on a cordial basis. Reese Publishing had enjoyed a pleasant success with Video Magazine. Then a publisher by the name of Richard Epps Extract jumped on the bed when I've been with a copycat publication dubbed Video Review. And while imitation may indeed be the sincerest form of flattery, when electronic fun with games and computers miraculously appeared on the newsstand approximately half a year after electronic games, it didn't go over well at Reese. It was bad enough that he was stealing the idea for a game magazine. Ideas, after all, are free. But they didn't even bother to disguise their lack of imagination by parroting that title. Well, over the years, Electronic Fun remained a second-class, second-rate publication. And while we actually befriended a couple of the uh, staff members, I especially enjoyed the work of Randy Hacker, who is today an outstanding writer of children's books, Fraternization was frowned on in those days. Now, I don't know who hated Extract and his barnacle-like attachment to Reese's ideas the most, Jay Rosenfield, that publisher, or Arnie. I'm sure it was the similarity of names, I mean, electronic fun, and it was, in fact, that very singularity that let Arnie rise to rise in the middle of a CES Activision Awards dinner and shoot the finger at one of the most powerful people in the business. Now, Arnie flipping the bird to a big exec at a CES dinner is a pretty good story on its own legs. But if you know Arnie, it becomes hysterical. I mean, Arnie was absolutely the coolest cat I have ever known when it comes to keeping his calm in a tense or potentially hostile situation. Me? I was more like a gas can that had been sitting in an enclosed, airless space for several months. Even think about lighting a match and I was apt to explode. Of course, those were my younger days and I have come a long way since then in terms of both age and maturity, at least age. Um, but I don't think I ever got into any public unpleasantness at an industry event unless you count the night in California when I was flown in with a bunch of other journalists for a press event and arrived so completely smashed that I wound up departing in a limo which somehow accumulated a pair of larcenous smokers by the time I got to my hotel. <laughs> I suspect I was never quite comfortable enough in a business setting to actually initiate a major disruption. Arnie always insisted I wear a tie and jacket to CES and E3, and we'd argue about it every show, and eventually I'd go shopping and find something offbeat enough to satisfy me, sufficiently acceptable to play Kate Arnie, who of course always wore the suit as per his training in trade journalism. So, he was right. I mean, that was the uniform of the day at industry events, unless you were Russ Sokolo. Now this legendary game journalist more or less derived the trade shows naked, not literally perhaps, but clad in jeans and a ratty shirt, he could touch the heart of even the stingiest public relations rep, and within 15 minutes he'd usually stacked enough game-related t-shirts, boxer shorts, socks, jackets, etc. onto his mule-like shopping cart to clothe a small army. More importantly, with regard to my own behavior, the discomfort created by having to wear even semi-formal attire proved sufficient to restrain my occasionally intemperate temper. But Arnie was like a rock. I swear on my mother that I have seen people unjustly insult this man to his face in the most inappropriate context imaginable. Invariably, my partner dwarfed whatever pea brain was verbally assaulting him. But Arnie never used the size to intimidate a tormentor. Instead, he'd say something like, I'm very sorry you feel that way in a voice 
literally awash in apparent sincerity. He would simply not lower himself to the level of his antagonist. And I often wish that I could control my behavior half as well. Uh, so you can imagine my surprise that night at, I believe, the summer CES of 1983. We were at an Activision dinner where the basic program consisted of a few words from Diane Drosnes, Activision's first PR person, and an award which EG was presenting to the company for innovation and all the other things for which you love good company. And Activision was a damn good company. President Jim Levy had come from the record industry where he had learned how to make hardcore, hardware software business work. In those days, the analogy heard most often was the razor and the razor blades. The game system was the razor, which could only be sold once, while the games were the blades, and would continue to do business until the customer decided to move to a non-compatible razor. Atari, on the other hand, thought only Atari games should be played on Atari machines, and became quite nasty when Jim Levy's vision was actually implemented. So Jim hired away the core, the creative core, of, act of, of Atari's first generation software magicians. It couldn't have been hard. All four of the original developers were going through the extremely disgruntled stage of their employment with Atari at the time, and Levy was making them an offer they couldn't refuse. Activision not only promised to give them game credit and a piece of the action, but planned to promote them as creative stars. It must have seemed like a dream come true for the quartet. And so Jim Levy brought the original four on board and created a company that gave legendary parties, produced legendary software, and turned out several of the most famous game creators in the business. Activision was obviously a company that was very close to our hearts at EG. Their arrival on the scene and their willingness to face down Atari allowed Arnie and I to launch our Arcade Alley review column for Video Magazine. Later, after the decision was made to launch EG, at least as a one-shot magazine, I was sent to the 1981 summer CES along with the video crew. I spent the entire show either serving booth duty, i.e. chatting up nerds, collecting business cards, and taking messages for people lucky enough to be elsewhere. A collection of tasks which elevate boredom to a form of intolerable torture. Or seeking out potential advertisers who would then be visited by our first class sales honcho, Eric Gare. I wanted to take the industry's temperature, so to speak, and the fact was it was pretty tepid. Of course, the only tool I had to help me sell this idea of a game magazine was a sheet of glossy paper featuring an early version of the first issue's cover with some cell sheet info on the back. It seemed incredibly puny to me, and obviously I wasn't the only one to draw that comparison. Atari, the company I expected to be the most interested in the game magazine idea, proved not only vaguely disinterested, but didn't even seem to understand why a consumer publisher would even produce a game-based magazine. Not that they were going to miss a chance to advertise in a publication aimed directly down the throats of its prime demographic. Atari always supported us in terms of advertising, PR, screenshots, beta versions of games, and anything else we wanted. They employed charming, attractive, all-American women exclusively as their PR people, and these ladies would help us get anything we asked for and were, without exception, a joy to work with. The problem was in the eyes of the Atari suits. Warner Brothers had already taken over the operation, and while there were some good people in the executive suite, I could see that several of the bean counters were simply covering their hindquarters. If the magazine was a hit and Atari wasn't all over it, they'd look like world-class fools. But all it took was one look in those dismissive eyes to know what they really thought of EG's chances. Who the hell wants to read about video games? Oh sure, they probably figured on something along the lines of Atari age coming out as a marketing vehicle to help stir up the audience over new products and licenses. But a newsstand publication? I I just don't think they got the point. It was really only at Activision that I finally met with the kind of reaction I had hoped for. A magazine? Cool! Pretty much summed up the reaction from the programmers right on up to Jim Levy himself. After all, Jim knew the music business and he knew that Rolling Stone and Cream were potentially the best friends any record company could have. 
It bounded the company on the paradigm of razors and razor blades, and he knew that players would flock to any magazine that could give them credible coverage of the game scene. Activision also didn't plan on licensing any coin-out pips. It would let Atari spend those bucks. Instead, it would produce games that were closer to arcade quality than even Atari's licensed titles. And a magazine in which they could show off those impressive graphics would go a long way toward helping Activision achieve that goal. So as a pair of startups with high hopes and big ideas, it was only natural that Arnie Joyce and I would become friendly with the Activision team from top to bottom. Now, as I recall, it was actually Arnie's idea to give Activision a special award from EG at CES Activision dinner party. I don't remember what the award was for exactly or even what it looked like. But I live, if I live to be so old, they keep my head in a bell jar, a la Futurama. I will never forget what happened when Jim Levy accepted that award. Now please indulge me as this all happened more than two decades ago, but I believe it was E.G. publisher J. Rosenfield who actually presented the award while Arnie Joyce and I sat at a front row table finishing up our dessert. Up on the dais, Jim Levy was smiling delightedly, hugging his award, and sip, stepping up to the podium to deliver his thanks. After the usual wah-wah, we all cranked up for the big finish. Little did we know. Jim slowly wrapped up his thank you. Oddly, I can still hear his words today. And so, because this means so very much to all of us at Activision, I want to thank our dear friends at Electronic. There was a pause. A passing instant. That's all it took for a simple word exchange to occur within the weary brain of Jim Levy. Electronic fun, he concluded, <laughs> thanking our hated enemies for the award we had just handed him. I saw Jay go white. I saw Jim Blanche as he suddenly realized he had said the wrong thing, and I saw the entire room swivel their heads in unison toward the direction of our table. I looked to the left, and there he stood in his black suit and $100 tie. My partner had shot up out of his seat and was extending his right arm directly into the air. But he wasn't starting a neo-Nazi pep rally. No, for as I followed his arm with my eyes, I passed his impeccable cufflinks and moved directly to his right hand, clenched in a bloodless fist with only the middle finger extended, pointing square into the face of Jim Levy. <laughs> games! Electronic games! Jim stammered immediately. I said electronic fun, but I meant electronic games! <laughs> Joyce was still attempting to get Arnie back into his seat, but there he remained, like the Statue of Liberty after getting cut off on the end of day. Finally, fixed in his fully erect position, fingers still trembling with accusation, he realized what he was doing. Arnie, the most in-control guy I have ever met, understood he had just lost it. The middle finger was the first to come down, followed by the arm, and then Arnie himself, returning to his seat, probably embarrassed to death by the incredible scene he had just called. And once again, a penitent Jim Levy repeated, I want to thank Electronic Games for this award. Hey, maybe Arnie overreacted on that long ago night. But you can certainly understand how we all felt at the moment. He was just the one who delivered the bird. And nobody ever got our name wrong again. Thank you. Um, I see we still have a little time left. If there's anybody with any questions, Kathy, you want to take over the... Yeah, Way over the questions. <laughs> Uh, what's Arnie Katz up to these days? Um, unfortunately, about eight months ago, uh, Joyce, his wife, and, and by the way, she was his wife from the very beginning, but used the name Joyce Worley, uh, she broke both her ankles in a, in a very bad fall, 
and uh, he's been uh, more or less taking care of her. Also, I don't know how many of you know this, but uh, since day one, in fact, since he was a teenager, Arnie has been blind in one eye. He was hit in the head with a bowling ball at a very young age. And uh, the, uh, the, the eyesight in his other eye is terrible. How he ever managed to become a video game journalist is something that I will never be able to understand and I will never be able to respect enough. But his eyes have also continued to deteriorate to the point where it is now, it's almost, it's a Beethoven-like situation. And the man can't even really appreciate the, the games anymore because he simply can't see them well enough. But I know before I came out here, he enjoys both asking me especially to wish everyone who came out here their very best because they think of you guys all the time. Anybody else? How long is the book? The book is 200 pages. Uh, it's digest size. And I would, I would actually have the cover here to show you, except for the fact that I took a Greyhound bus out here. And by the time I got here, they had gone through my bag so many times. I, Homeland Security has nothing on Greyhound buses. I want to tell you, if any of you are concerned about Greyhound buses running amok and smashing it, don't worry about it. These guys check your luggage more often than anybody I've ever seen, including out loud. Uh, so, you know, and it, it got lost. But in any case, uh, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful cover. Michael Thomason from GoodDealGames.com put the cover together. Uh, it's, uh, I say it's 200 pages. It includes pictures, as I say. I mean, hey, look, do, do you have a picture of Al Miller in a gigantic styrofoam cowboy hat? I didn't think so. Okay? Uh, this is the only place you will ever get to see things like this. And a lot of pictures from old CESs and E3s and things like that. So uh, I, I just kind of collected my favorite stuff. And uh, the only thing I could not find, and I would have published it, I mean, there, there's a chapter, in fact, in the book called Sex, Drugs, and Clone Ops. So I'm not hiding anything here. Uh, but uh, there, I had a picture that was drawn for us by the cover artist who drew, I think, I think it's maybe next to number one, the most famous issue of electronic games, the one where Pac-Man and Ms. Pac-Man get married and with the pink background, and it's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, he drew an extra little drawing for me uh, of the honeymoon night. <laughs> and the, the only balloon is Waka Waka. <laughs> And I looked everywhere for that darn thing and could not find it. But I promise if there is a second edition, uh, it'll be in there. Anybody else? When, yes. In 1984, when all the magazines were rushing to rebrand themselves as computer publications, yes. what, I mean, was it just a pure panic, or was there any strategy in that at all? Because, of course, they all revert back. Right. It, well, to say it was a panic is understandable because we went, I guess, in December of 1983 uh, to December of 1984. I guess we went from somewhere around 60 pages of ads to about 12. So that, boy, I'll tell you, that makes salespeople so nervous you cannot believe it, okay? And ironically, uh, a full year before there was any change in the title, Arnie had suggested that we might want to think about changing the name to Electronic Entertainment because at the time, computers were becoming a bigger, bigger thing. And an interesting thing happened in that uh, right around 19, late 84, 85, people began to see games in an entirely different perspective. I'm sure it's hard for some of the younger folks here to remember this and or even understand this, but uh, around 1984, it suddenly seemed to dawn on people that, why are we playing these video games? We should be getting computers and doing serious things. I mean, if, believe it or not, we were told by our publisher and by our new sales lady, lovely, lovely lady, may she rot in hell forever, uh, <laughs> that we should avoid the use of certain phrases. Now, 
I, you know, mother effer or whatever. I, I have no problem with that. But the phrases were, in fact, fun and games. They didn't want us using those words. This is pretty tough in a magazine called Electronic Games, let me tell you. Uh, and, but the idea was that the only acceptable way to play games at that point was to play simulation. Because simulations are not games, they are pure entertainment. They are a learning experience, they enrich our lives. Uh, I remember uh, a simulation of a dairy farm. Now there's something I've dreamed of my whole <laughs> life. Uh, and it got so ridiculous, it really did. For a while there, I mean, we survived by writing for magazines like Ahoy that covered, you know, the C64 game scene. And we, we were fortunate enough to move on to like Analog and ST-Log and then they were sold to Larry Flint and we were able to move along to video games and computer entertainment, which I'm sure Chris remembers pretty well. Uh, and uh, we're ironically, uh, we wound up covering the computer games. Because at this point, we've been covering computer games for two or three years. So uh, put them on the computer games, despite the fact that we had lost our jobs previously, basically, because we were considered the video game people. But, uh, no, it, it was a real panic. But, you know, I often think, what would have happened had they gutted it out? I mean, they made enough money on electronic games to move from a dump in the Bowery to the penthouse floor of the Grumbacher building on 34th Street and 10th Avenue, and they bought it with cash. And they bought it with cash that came primarily from Electronic Games magazine. Now, I would think at that point, you can say to yourself, let's do a little research. There's a game system already developed in Japan. And it's selling, it's popular, it's going to be here. But no one believed it. The belief was when the thing started, it's a fad, it's a hula hoop, and eventually it's going to die, and when it dies, it's never going to come back. And we were never able to convince the people who really mattered that you, you realize that electronic games could be the TV guide. Of, of game magazines today, had it stayed around all, all that time. And they only endured two lean years, and God knows they had enough cash to endure two lean years. Uh, by, 90, by 86, the NES is up, and the game scene is exploding again. And uh, yet they gave that all up because they were convinced that it was over, it was done, and it wasn't just them, it was everyone, it was, uh, it was the retailers who started dumping games into boxes for $2 out, out in front of the store. I mean, uh, it's pretty hard to sell a game for $30, $40 when they're selling them for $3 outside the store. So uh, I think basically what happened was that the industry, the consumers, the distributors, everybody just sort of gave up on video games. Just sort of had the perception that it was the foot in the door. We were babies then. We had to play with games. And that was the only way we would ever be able to take the next step and move into computers. And of course now computer games are deader than Kelsey's nuts. So what has all of this taught? Us. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> anybody else have anything? Yeah. What do you think about the state of gaming journalism today? Uh, it's funny. Uh, Lenny asked me to write a chapter on that. Okay. And I went out to my local. Uh, uh, well, where do you get magazines today? I went out to my local supermarket. <laughs> where else? And uh, I picked up one of each. And, you know, some are better than others, and, you know, the, none seem to offer analysis. Uh, you know, to me, the problem is magazines can't compete with online. They, they can't. It's instantaneous. The information is instantaneous online. It's so difficult. What I believe magazines have to offer, if they have anything left to offer, except tips and tricks, of course, uh, which will always, there'll always be a market for it because they're collected neatly in one place. 
and it's easy to find them, and edited by an, an excellent editor, and those columns are killer. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, but but for a serious game magazine, Next Generation was the last one we had. Yeah. Uh, and and what did Next Generation had? Next Generation had the ability and the space to analyze, to take, and even so, I mean, when Next Generation would periodically do their 100 greatest games of all time, it would be impossible to find a game older than three years old. They'd invariably stick a sidebar up there somewhere, the classic games, you know. Uh, you know Pac-Man can't possibly compete with SOCOM. Uh, you know, Tetris can't possibly compete with, you know, what Unreal, whatever the latest version is, you know. Uh, I mean, please, these, these were people, I mean, it's like comparing cave paintings to, you know, acrylics and, 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 and spray paints and things like that. They were tools that simply weren't available. People were painting on the walls in dyed colors. I mean, all right, you can't get the Mona Lisa that way. Uh, that doesn't mean that those cave paintings aren't beautiful things in and of themselves. It, it's, it's just a shame if you look what the film industry has done. It's basically ghettoized silent films. If you look what the television industry has done, it's basically ghettoized radio drama. That's all gone. That stuff, it, it exists on DVDs, and if you're really interested, you can find it and collect it. But it, you know, and, 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 and thank God that the games industry has not done the same thing with its classic games. It's, it, it's realized that, you know, the, the, the way that this has to be done is, you know, it's a, it's a line. I mean, the same games that were great and entertaining back then are still great and entertaining, only now you can do them with fantastic sounding graphics. What could be better than that? You know, so it, it, it's a positive sign. I think it shows our industry is a more mature industry in some ways. It's a less mature industry in other ways in that it fails to credit its creators. Uh, you're lucky if you get the name of the team on the game. And in that case, it's probably not the same team who made the last game under that name since they will all have left and started their own development companies by now. So, you know, I, I mean, the, that's the equivalent of asking someone to buy a book because it was published by Doubleday, or, or asking someone <laughs> to buy a record because it was published by Atlantic. It's absolutely absurd that I should buy a game because it's an EA game. Excuse me. They're a publisher. They are not creators, okay? And in that sense, the industry is very backward and always has been. It's made a couple of tentative steps, the early days of Activision, the early days of EA, but Lawrence Probst III has pretty much seen the destruction of all of that while also buying up things like NFL football that for 30 years anyone could make an NFL football game if they could buy the license. But the greed of the football teams, the greed of the players, and the greed of the companies have now made that impossible. And rather than take them to court on it, what does Take Two do? We'll get baseball! Now, that's the kind of retarded thinking that, you know, that constantly gets this industry in trouble. But, uh, you know, for better or worse, in any case, this, this book will be out November 20th. If any of you make the, the, the Philly Con on, I believe it's the 11th, 10th and 11th, something like that, I will be there with Lenny and we'll be signing books and we'll actually have copies and stuff like that. I say 200 pages. Um, I didn't pick this up because it was the best chapter, but I thought it would be a funny chapter to, to read, and I wanted to entertain you primarily. And uh, is that about it? Are we on schedule? It was a little time for more questions. Oh, if anybody else has questions, I'm more, I mean, my math doesn't ever stop. Right? Yes, sir. <laughs> it seems like uh, when I've got to look up the first information on games lately, We'll go to a website like I think like IGN or something like that, mm -hmm. where they have subscription-based, subscription-based journals. If you want more information, you got to pay the subscription fee. We haven't yet signed up for any of those because I'm kind of a casual game player. Yes. But what do you think? How, how's that? What impact do you think those are having on the computer gaming magazines? 
I, I, I don't think a tremendous amount because I don't think a tremendous amount of people are willing to pay for information. Well, I mean, they, what are you going to do? A big story comes out, okay? Tomorrow, Trip Hawkins shoots Ben Gordon, okay? What are they going to do? Keep it on the secret section that only subscribers get to read about? It? <laughs> you know, uh, it's insane. I mean, you, you, you can't, big information will always get out. So what you're buying is secondary information, the information that wasn't good enough to get up on the first page. And I think that as long as that's the perception, even if that's not true, I think that's the perception on the part of most people who go to these sites. They seem like, I can get everything I want for free. Well, what am I, what am I gonna pay for? What more are they gonna offer me, you know? And, uh, it, you know, if you ran maybe a paragraph of the story and said, if you want to read the entire story like the New York Times does, uh, then I think it can work. And I think that it's a viable uh, thing. But I, I think as long as the perception is that, you know, as I say, I'm, I'm getting everything I need for free. Uh, but if I kind of like to help them out, I'd subscribe to them. And then I'd get more stories that mostly I wouldn't read. Yes, sir. Is there any place for the lone game developer, or is it all game engines? I don't know. I've met an awful lot of lone game developers here. Uh, uh, I, I talked to Alan Miller, and uh, he's basically, I mean, these are small companies, but remember the, uh, the whole cell phone thing has just uh, reinvigorated classic gaming to an extent that it's unbelievable because all of a sudden, I mean, we're cell phones, you know, they can't play Doom 3 yet, okay? It's going to be a while. Uh, so people are suddenly rediscovering these very simple, these basic single screen games or, you know, whatever. And uh, the, the cell phone market is the, is the perfect place for that. And I, I, I think you're going to see a lot of one man, I see a lot of one and two-man companies springing up. Uh, Handheldgames.com, check them out, they're very good. Uh, uh, Tom Fessler, a good friend of mine. Uh, in fact, uh, most of the companies I work with these days are at least planning ahead to get into the cell phone game market. So uh, that's how I guess I'm suddenly getting called for jobs. <laughs> he remembers that stuff! He, he remembers those games, y'all bet! Uh, so they call me and say, what games can we steal? You know? Uh, <laughs> and uh, I tell them. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, sir. I really loved the electronic games. Thank and, you. Uh, I uh, was so sad to see it go, and then it came back for a little while. Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, possibility of that coming back under that name and similar format? Uh, original? I would love to see it come back. It would not come back under the three of us, I suspect, because I, I, I just don't think Arnie and Joseph's health is, is up to producing you know, a regular magazine. I would love to see somebody take the name. I mean, I have no objection to them taking the name. As far as I know, the name is not even owned by anybody. It's the perfect name for a game magazine. And remember, our perception was always, we were not a video game magazine or a computer game magazine. We were an electronic game magazine. Handhelds, tabletop games, mission trainers, exactly. The whole nine yards. That. Because to me, even if you didn't go to the arcades and play coin-ups, you still wanted to know what was there. You still wanted to know where they were at compared to the games you were playing. And, you know, that that was always our, our perception. And I'd love to see somebody take that gauntlet up and, and go with it. A, a younger generation, you well, know. Not just the name, but the, the, the very style. But this, exactly, yes. The style, the whole presentation, where you've got a column devoted to each type of gaming and, uh, and, and you know, the, and analysis, you know. Think about how does this game relate to a game maybe 20 years old? Often they do. I mean, many of these games can be traced back. Linear Descent. This, this game is here. I mean, Command and Conquer uh, was originally inspired by a war game on the TG-16. Uh, Herzog's Rye, I believe it was called. Uh, and, you know, I mean, the, these games, you know, they progress. Sometimes the idea doesn't get over the first couple of times, and then the third time, bang, it's a smash hit because the graphics and the, the stuff are caught up. 
but yes, I know. Anybody out there who's feeling ambitious and thinks, yeah, electronic games, you know, just come see me. I mean, uh, I'd be happy to, to bestow my blessing on everyone in this room. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> We just don't have to look kind of now. Not when Arnie's around. Because, I mean, he may be a little older, but I, I guarantee you he'll still shoot right up out of that scene. <laughs> you guys have been great. This has been absolute fun. I've never read to anyone before, so it's been a unique experience. Thank you all so much.